Hey Lonnie, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Doing like great for, great for, um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to, uh, to join the podcast. Okay. So you're really deep into auditing. You're with a top 10 accounting firm in the States and very specifically, you work with technology companies, D2C e-commerce brands. Do you want to just give us your backstory up until now? How did you sort of come to where you are now? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, I'm an audit partner at Witham. Uh, I've been with Witham for uh, about 13 years. I'm a member of our technology emerging growth practice, um, and I co-lead our e-commerce sector. Uh, you know, I think I found accounting, you know, at an early age, I really was interested in business. Uh, mm -hmm. My first job in high school, I was a assistant bookkeeper at the Staten Island Yankees. Mm -hmm. If anyone's a New Yorker, um, you might know the Staten Island Yankees. Um, also had a paper out. Uh, so, you know, my first experience teaching me, you know, about client service was, was sort of that, that first, um, you know, that paper out, that first uh, work experience, you know, working as a bookkeeper for a number of years. Um, you know, got me excited about learning the ins and outs of a business and, and accounting was sort of pitched to me as, you know, it's the backbone of a, of a business, right? You, you kind of learn, hmm. um, you know, how a business operates, how a business makes money um, and what they're interested in from a financial perspective. Um, so that's kind of how I started, um, found with them, you know, right out of school, right out of college and, um, you know, kept finding reasons to stick around. Um, you know, it gave me a lot of opportunities to, to travel, work with different clients. Um, and then eventually I found technology, uh, joined our technology emerging growth group, moved to New York from New Jersey, um, and found e-commerce from there. So, so e-commerce sits under our technology umbrella, uh, and kind of e-commerce kind of came naturally to me. I was working on a lot of e-commerce clients. Uh, you know, I found interest in working with clients where I was also a customer, which was you know, great. And um, I, I understood the nuances around inventory, revenue recognition, you know, some of the nuances that e comms space today from an accounting perspective. So what kind of e-commerce brands work with, with, with them? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, we, we work with, you know, anywhere from, you know, pre-revenue small companies to large public companies. So we have a kind of run the full gamut. Um, you know, our, I would say our bread and butter is around the Series A, Series B, you know, 30 to 50 million top line revenue, mm -hmm. um, you know, D to C or, or B to B, depending on the, the business and what the product is. Um, but not, not only just true, you know, e-commerce, a business selling products to customers. Um, we also work with e-com enabling, enablement companies. So mm -hmm. um, think software SaaS companies that, you know, operate in the back end to support e-commerce businesses. Um, so we kind of run through, you know, a um, wide um, array of different clients that um, are in this space and int interested in the topics, the, mm -hmm. the industry and um, what's happening in the industry. Okay, that's really smart. So, so it's the entire ecosystem, the, the, the demand side and, and supply side in terms of the people who sell us the tools and, and also actually do the work and build the brand. From what I picked up from, from what you just said, you you're servicing funded companies you know so um companies that are quite ambitious they're they're, they're, they're they've done their their, their, their seed round they're, they're going through their series a and series b and they need accountants we'll jump into those specific needs but with the economic downturn what's 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 been the lay of the land from your perspective with them because you're seeing the numbers and as you said that your you, accounting is the backbone so so what, what does the backbone look like right now in 2024 yeah it's interesting you know post covid you know covid really changed consumer behavior right um you know, think going back to mid 2020 um you know through the end of 2021 there were incredible peaks from an e-commerce business perspective right there was this huge surge um, consumers were stuck at home, right? Sitting on their couch, a little more disposable income because they're not, you know, traveling, not going out. Um, so, you know, they're buying goods online, right? So, um, you know, a lot of our clients faced, you know, um, uh, a good issue, right? They, they were growing rapidly, right? Um, and they had to keep up with the growth. 
Um, then you kind of saw 2022 interest rates are climbing, consumer spend declining. Um, I think which is a big contributor to the, the downturn, I guess, in e-coms. Um, so you're kind of seeing, you know, through COVID, there's this peak, and then there's sort of a plateau um, and and a slowdown, right? So, um, you know, I think with interest rates expected to slow down, you know, um, hopefully later this year, I think that will potentially open up people's wallets a little bit more. Um, consumer spend might go up, but you know, 24. You know, it's it, you know, it's anyone's guess, but you know, I would expect maybe a modest growth year. You know, maybe a flat year. Mm -hmm. um, but we're kind of seeing those mac macro trends. Our e-coms are facing, um, you know, challenges, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think from a consumer perspective, expectations are higher, right? The, um, you know, through COVID, you know, a lot of different brands came out and. Um, you know, really, really thrived, right? Um, so consumers are, you know, or these brands are facing expectations that Amazon built, right? Consumers expecting same day delivery, free shipping, personalization, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability, um, you name it. So it's so it's really competitive out there, um, and, and that's what kind of retailers have to do to, you know, make sure they're touching on all those points to to stay competitive. And and have the accounting needs changed from the COVID peak in twenty one twenty two to now in twenty four? What, what sort of financial needs do, do are they coming to you for restructures? Yeah, um, it's, you know when when you're growing rapidly, mm -hmm. you know you're probably getting more capital infusion, um, more more investors, more mature investors. And when you have more mature investors and, you know, banks, if you're raising debt, debt you know, debt financing, uh, more people are looking at your financial statements, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you 2x year over year or 3x or even 10x, um, your, you know, financials become, uh, you know, a bigger topic of conversation. Um, so accounting needs, you know, there's always tax compliance, even, you know, early stage companies, you need to be compliant. Um, sales tax, you know, that, that's a big hot topic, making sure you're compliant. You know, companies went from being a small e-commerce company to then overnight selling in 50 states, right? Mm -hmm. And um, to, to be compliant from a sales tax perspective, there's, there's this idea of nexus of, of, of you know, having um, presence in, in different states, not, not only physical presence, um, but if you're you know, doing business in those states, right? Even remotely, or if you have an employee in the states. So there's different rules in different states that require um, compliance from a sales tax perspective, mm -hmm. and also a corporate, you know, tax perspective. So understanding the needs around that, you know, with with, a, with these companies that grow overnight, um, it's a lot of catch up, right? A lot of catching up to make sure they have the right advisors in place, the right the right software, um, you know, and that's where you know we come into play, right? We we help with um, you getting tax compliant, corporate taxes, sales tax. We help with, you know, understanding your financial statements, consulting on a number of accounting issues, and mm -hmm. um, helping you prepare financial statements if, if you're going to need to, you know, need an audit. Mm -hmm. um, and an audit requirement could come from the bank, could come from investors. So it, it really depends on the, the size and complexity of the, of the company. We're going to speak speak about audit a, a little while because we're having conversations in in our companies about in, in our company about about audit. But digging deep into your portfolio of, of clients, and you don't need to mention names. What are thriving clients doing well? What what are you seeing? Because you, you're privy to to a lot of data. Why do you think e-commerce companies now in 2024 that that are doing well are performing the way they're doing in comparison to to the rest yeah it's um it's interesting we see a lot of different brands right we see brands struggle we see brands you know thrive and be successful you know even in economic downturn um you know a lot of it is the product what is the product and how are you you know you know product market fit right how are you mm -hmm. um delivering that product to the consumer uh you know, there's certain industries that, you know, can sustain economic downturn. You know, we see a lot with, you know, baby products, right? Or, or you know, post-COVID, you know, beauty is a, is a good industry that, um, you know, we see success in. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's the, you have the right advisors, you have the right 
a strategy um, and you are speaking to your consumer, right? You're not just trying to grow the business from a top line perspective. It's understanding the consumer, making sure you're, you know, addressing those those expectations, right? Customization, personalization. You know, a lot of our clients are utilizing softwares to, um, you know, use data analytics and AI to, um, you know, enhance that personalized shopping experience. Um, implementing customer loyalty programs, right? Being creative to, to offer that, you know, personalized content um, and knowing how to, you know, um, you know, sell to their customers. And then once you obtain the customers, you know, cost of acquiring a customer, you know, that it could be a high cost, right? But um, how do you keep them, right? How do you keep those customers and, you know, how do you treat those customers throughout your life cycle? Um, so, you know, through through the last couple of years, you've seen, you know, some shrinkage from e-commerce companies where they sort of plateaued right after after COVID, after the growth years. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're seeing a lot of lean and mean teams, right? I mean, maybe that are cutting back on costs from a personnel perspective, um, you know, and, and kind of shifting focus to profitability. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's a number of things of, you know, making sure you're gearing your product and your your efforts towards your consumer um, and then making sure you're, you know, to be financially successful, making sure you're, um, you know, spending your money in the right, the right places. Yeah. And, and I have to say that AI hasn't, has, has, has been perfect timing, you know, sorry, people have, you know, lost, lost their jobs, but when you streamline, you find that, um, AI can actually improve the productivity of, you know, who, whoever is, is left to so take, say an email team for instance and you know just crafting of of email flows or your customer service team having an ai assistant you know help with crafting emails in real time so you just put the intention you know on there you know this is how you want to respond and just doing that in seconds so you're going through so many tickets very quickly and it's it's great timing i can't can't, you know um, deny that right right so with regards to to clients of yours, um, again, another question has to do with like capital raising. Did did every one of your clients um, intentionally sort of get into business with a view that okay, we want to build something really huge here, really impactful rather, and so we're going to need capital to to to, to grow this? Or did some customers sort of initially start out in the bootstrap? sort of route and realize okay um this is a really big problem and and so we will you know eventually need to realize we, we need you know um capital we need to get into the capital markets to, to raise but what's been the the journey of um yeah, yeah for our client base it's you know a lot of vc backed companies mm-hmm. um, pe backed or um you know raising debt financing um that's typically when they need to sort of upgrade their you know, uh, advisors to, to a level of sophistication that, you know, they may need an audit, they may need to do more tax compliance. So most of our clients are sort of the, the venture capital backs, um, you know, raising a, a series A, series B. Um, but certainly there's a case for bootstrapping, right? Um, bootstrapping allows you to maintain, maintain control, right? Hold more equity of the company, mm. uh, you know, allows you to encourage growth through sweat equity. Um, you know, an e-commerce business, I would say, is probably pretty challenging to bootstrap. Typically requires a lot of infrastructure, um, inventory. You know, if you're if you you have a model where you're holding a lot of inventory, it's costly. You need a warehouse. Um, you, you know, you need personnel. Um, and if you want to grow quickly, you know, fundraising is almost always necessary. I would say, you know, mm-hmm. things move pretty quickly. You know, especially in the last few years, you'll you know we've seen companies two x, three x, or you know, ten x overnight. Um, so you, you need capital to support that. Um, you know, there's certainly businesses maybe that have a dropship model, maybe, you know, aren't necessarily prepaying for inventory um, that could survive with, with less capital. Um, but, you know, we've typically seen, you know, through a couple of years back, you know, growing top line revenue was the primary focus, right? Growing quickly, mm-hmm. raising capital to grow quickly. Um, that sort of is shifting in the last, you know, last year or so, um, with the shift towards, um, you know, profitability. Um, so, 
so food shopping is possible, but you know, I think yeah. it's I think it's challenging. For it you makes know. it makes a lot of sense. What well, what's been the capital raising challenges? You know, with with these businesses now, um, given all, all that, that that that's you know transpired, particularly with with rising interest rates. Yeah, um, you know that customer expectations are higher, right? There's also investor expectations are higher. Um, there's increased competition for e-commerce in general. The whole landscape is crowded. Um, it, it makes it challenging to stand out as an e-commerce business, as a brand, right? You have to differentiate differentiate yourself through a, some sort of value prop. Um, and, and by doing that, you have to speak to the consumer, right? What, what does the consumer want? You know, how can you gain traction from the consumer? Um, but it's costly to acquire customers. So, the, you know, the, some of the challenges are just customer acquisition costs. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to, um, really expensive to market and, and to acquire new customers. If you're going on Facebook and TikTok and, you know, social media. Um, so, so balancing sort of the acquisition cost of the customer with, Customer lifetime value is crucial. Um, customer lifetime value being, you know, the the longevity of a customer. How long are your customers actually sticking with you, right? And mm. that again depends on the profit um, or the, the the product, right? Um, so we have subscription. You know, we have a lot of clients that do subscription based models, and mm. you have sort of that reoccurring revenue. But how often do you have consumers canceling subscriptions, right? Mm. Um, so. You know, raising capital is challenging given the the increased competition. Um, you know, the harder to you know it's harder to become profitable if it's you know customer acquisition costs are high. Um, and then there's supply chain disruptions, right? There's there's always you know understanding your supply chain where you're sourcing your inventory, shipping delays, and and actually you know satisfying customer needs on time. Um, I think that's always a challenge. Um, so there's a big it's a big web of, you know, logistics and, and, and um, understanding your customer. And uh, yeah, I think, I think all that competition just makes it harder to, to raise capital. And, um, you know, there's dry powder out there. There's, there's investors looking to, to invest, but um, you need, as a founder, you need to go in with a, um, you have to be profitable or, at, or have a really defined path to profitability. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't, you know, you can't just show up and say we're growing, you know, year over year, and we, you know, we want a new round. It's, I think, it's getting a little bit more, um, you know, a little more stringent with um, the requirements for for investors. What's the what's the appetite for for investors now? Is is, is more debt coming through versus equity? Is the, what's the debt to equity sort of um, landscape now? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of bridge rounds um, from an equity perspective. You know, you have companies that don't necessarily want to go to, you know, the next round just yet. They want to wait until maybe valuations could come up. Um, so we're seeing a lot of bridge financing um, and companies exploring other debt vehicles um, rather than raising a new equity round, um, which would bring on, you know, potentially new investors, um, investors that might want more, you know, a bigger piece of the pie. Um, so I think, you know, rather than giving away some equity, we're seeing sort of the shift to maybe some non-traditional debt financing and, um, you know, getting creative with how they're going to, um, you know, sustain, right. And, and continue growing, but also sustain. Um, so, you know, it's a combination of, um, doing bridge financing, you know, bridge round from ex existing investors, um, exploring some debt vehicles. And, um, and and cutting costs, right? So we have some plenty of clients going through reduction forces, and um, you know, looking for areas to cut costs and um, and continue their path to profitability. Interesting. Is is the bridge financing coming from their existing investors from the VC funds, or are they looking, you know, for for bridge fin financing elsewhere? Yeah, it's typically from existing investors. You know, extensions of old rounds. Um, you know, rather than going out new investors, um, typically would, you know, want to do evaluation, understand, you know, do a little, do a little bit more diligence likely. So, um, you know, they're considering scalability of the company, you know, competitive positioning and the technology that these companies have and, you know, existing investors are typically, you know, aware of all that, right? They're, they're, you know, they sit on the board or they're, 
are close to the financial statements and the, and the operation of the business. Um, not to say it's, you know, new investors can't come in and, 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 um, and invest in a company and sort of do a, a, a smaller round, but um, we're, we are seeing a lot of bridge rounds with our existing investors. Yes, and, and, and I guess it also secures their position till, you know, the, the, the market sort of ease off, you know, a bit, you know, longer term. Exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Um, on the flip side, you, you mentioned the e-commerce enablement, you know, space. How, how does that compare? How, how, what's the activity in the e-commerce enablement space, that's the e-commerce SaaS space versus um, consumer brands? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I've seen a lot of talk about e-com enablement. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I talked to some, you know, research analysts in the space and, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of discussion around that from, you know, the back end or front end of a, of a you know, e-commerce business. And, um, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of investment in e-commerce enablement uh, because it just further pushes that, you know, uh, growth mentality for an e-commerce business they, they need software they need technology right they need, they need to be on the forefront of technology to support their business um you know when you think of an e-commerce business from a consumer's perspective you think of um you know i click a couple buttons and i get a product shipped to my doorstep but um you don't realize the amount of technology that goes behind the scenes from you know order placement from a website to um you know where's that being sourced from so sourcing, um, you, you know, there's softwares just to project inventory at a SKU level. Um, there, there's softwares to just help navigate this sort of omni-channel approach to selling. Right, you're you're in retail locations, you're you know online D to C, you're fulfilled by Amazon. Um, there's multi multiple levels, you know, behind the scenes to get the product to the consumer. Um, so, I, you know, I definitely see a, you know, a, a conversation of enablement technology. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty prevalent. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what, what, you know, what we see next in that. There's a lot of technology out there and um, disruptors. There's a lot of disruptors in this space. Um, so, you know, really excited to see what's, what's, what's coming. Super. Same here. I found that a lot of the e-commerce SaaS founders, you know, that, that have come on this show, at least and I've spoken to, um, have been operators themselves. So they 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 know the pain points. They they understand what it feels like, you know, to 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 to, to be an operator, what the challenges are, and 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 their best their best place, particularly if they know the technology, or they at least they have the team to execute on the technology. That they're able to, to roll out really, really nifty solutions. So it's, it's an exciting time, you know, nonetheless, because I'm still seeing raises, you know, in, 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 that, um, in, in that space. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch and, and see. Okay. So for, for listeners who are building, you know, um, companies, you know, that impactful companies and, and, and looking to, 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 to raise, you know, further, it might not be now, it might be, in a year's time when, when the market, you know, has more, much more activity, why is there a need for, for them to, to get audited? Yeah. Um, you know, an audited financial statement is, effect, you know, it's a third-party independent CPA firm, you know, reviewing, auditing your company, right, auditing the mm -hmm. financial statement. So what we do is we look at a company's financial statements, you know, we take a risk-based approach and. Um, we take a deep dive on on some of the um, uh, you know significant areas of your financial statement. So when you think about an e-commerce company, you know we, we spend a lot of time with inventory. We we spend a lot of time with revenue, understanding revenue. Um, we spend a lot of time with equity. If there's a complex you know cap table structure, capitalized software. If you're you know capitalizing any website development or any software you're utilizing internally. Um, you know, from a fundraising perspective, companies are out there fundraising all the time, right? And if you, and if you want to raise that next round of financing, we typically see an, an audit requirement around the Series A, Series B, raising a debt round. And, um, you know, banks will say, hey, we, we're okay with lending you this, you know, $10 million, but we want to see audited financial statements, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be proactive there, right? Companies, you know, plenty of times have, come to us and say, hey, we need an audit because our bank told us and it's due in 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. And 
you know, if you don't know what an audit is, you know, you know, it doesn't take 30 days. It certainly can be done if, you know, all the resources, you know, are there, but, um, you know, we're scheduling audits out six months in advance. Um, and a, and a first year audit could take, you know, six to 10 weeks plus, um, depending on how clean and, 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 you know, clean the books records are. Um, so yeah, from an, a founder perspective, from management perspective of a company, um, being proactive, understanding what your you know next one to five years will look like, um, and then you know reaching out and getting the right advi advisors in your in your corner um, early on, because um, there's a lot of complexities. You know, you, you think you have your financials in order, but you know when you get to a third party looking and poking around, um, mm -hmm. you know you're going to find that there there might be some skeletons hiding and Mm -hmm. um, that's what we do. We, you know, we help our clients get to a point where they can raise capital and, and hit their next level of financing, right? So we're not just, um, you know, we're, we're doing compliance, but we're also, you know, uh, advisors to our, to our clients. So we could see what your, you know, since we work from early stage to growth, we kind of see what your life cycle is, uh, what your plan is, what your exit strategy is, and we set you up for success. Um, so if you plan to go public, if you plan to get acquired, you know, we're making sure that, you know, if you're going to go through a dil diligence round with a potential investor that, um, you know, you're checking all the boxes um, mm -hmm. from a risk and exposure perspective. Mm -hmm. And from a firm selection perspective, how should e-commerce businesses navigate? Because there's sometimes you say, okay, you're just starting out. You, you raise some 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 seed, you know, um, money. You, you you've seen traction. You've got your first say, ten thousand customers. Revenues is say two, three, four million. And you approach some firm saying, look, we want to get audited because we're looking to um to 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 to, to make some subsequent to go for some subsequent rounds, you know, further. And then looking at your revenue and that initial conversation is like, well, you're not really in our revenue threshold, but obviously you're ambitious and you know where you want to go. How do you select it, given the fact that the switching cost, both from a time and let's forget the financial, just switching from firm to firm is just a headache. You, you said already right. you're planning six months in advance. So what is the conundrum here? How, how, how should we, you know, as, as e-commerce operators, you know, um, navigate that, that, that pathway? Yeah, I would say doing it in steps, right? You don't necessarily need to jump into an audit right away. Um, if you're planning to raise financing, you know, if you're planning to raise a seed round, you don't typically see an audit requirement during a seed round. Um, you know, if you're planning to raise an A, you know, it, it, next year, you know, I would say start talking to people. Start talking to your advisors now. Um, getting compliant from a tax perspective, I say, would be, you know, your first priority. Making sure you're filing taxes in the right jurisdictions, uh, sales tax compliance. You know you're selling products that are likely taxable, right? You know, make, making sure you're you're filing um, in the right states. Um, doing doing that exposure analysis um, because then you know with an audit is required to you know raise capital potentially right, at, at any stage, right? So um, as you're growing, I would say do that first, right? Get get sale get compliant there mm -hmm. from an accounting perspective. Um, you could sort of build up toward, towards an audit, right? Um, first step is making sure you're doing your bookkeeping correctly, right? Uh, are you outsourcing it or do you have someone internal? Um, you know, do you have a team that is working on it? If you're a seed company, you're prob it's probably, you know, outsourcing or you have sort of a one-person show um, internally, um, which is fine. But when you get to a point where when you're being audited, um, you know, we've worked with plenty of outsourced account accounting firms through an audit process. Um, but there's only so much they know, right? They don't, they're not, you know, day in day in the operation of the business. So they're, they're typically, you know, there's headaches involved with that, right? So um, stepping up to an audit, so getting the bookkeeper, you know, getting a, a key hire, maybe a controller or, you know, accounting manager early yeah. on. Um, and then you don't necessarily need to jump into an audit right away. You could do a reviewed financial statement, which is sort of a step down from an audit. Um, so think sort of... Um, you know, the minor leagues versus the big leagues. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of warm up to it, right? And, and a review is primarily inquiries and analytics. You're not doing like audit test work. Um, but the, 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 the end product is, is similar. It's a financial statement, full, full set of disclosures, 
um, our opinion would just change. It's, it's not an audit opinion. It's just an accountant's conclusion, um, providing limited assurance rather than you know um, uh, reasonable assurance on the on the financial statements. Got it. Got it. So so okay. Like a reviewed financial statement. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. And um, yeah, a financial controller is really important because I think that is the personnel you'd be liaising with um, as a as as an auditor. You'd be working closely with the. You don't want to work with a founder, do you? You want to work with a with with, with someone with those, who has financial acumen. It, exactly, and a founder shouldn't be the pay, the point person for an audit, yeah. right? This is you know the the founder should be focused on the operations, growing the business, and you know. Founders ever looped into an audit to, to an extent where it's you know a second job and um, yeah, there's probably a pro- an issue there. So when's the perfect time to get a financial controller in? You know, it depends on the business, depends on you know how complex um, the company is. You know, I have some clients who are smaller, drop ship, not a lot of complexity around inventory. Um, you know, not a lot, not a lot of complexity about revenue around revenue, and they you know, kind of operate with a, with an accounting manager and an outsourced bookkeeper um, and this, you know, Series A company, right? Um, but I would say typically around, you know, when you're ramping up to a Series A, um, you kind of want to have that more sophisticated, um, you know, key hire from the accounting finance perspective, um, even prior to that, right? To, so they can have time to learn the business, understand the business, understand the nuances. Um, because when you start raising rounds with sophisticated investors, um, you know, they're going to be poking around a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and maybe potentially asking for an audit. Um, and when it, when you get to an audit, um, you definitely want to have a, a key hire to, to kind of run that process. Yeah. yeah. And then what are your thoughts on fractional financial controllers? It's, it's become a thing now in e-commerce, I think, since COVID. A lot of fractional CF, CF, CFOs have, have, have e-commerce that is um, have, have popped out, so, you know, offering their services. Yeah, no, it's great. I, you know, I, I talked to a lot of fractional CFOs in the space, um, you know, that are doing work with a lot of interesting companies. So, you know, from from my view, it's always good to get a different perspective on the business, right? Have an outsider mm-hmm. come in, understand the business. Even if it's working in a limited capacity, you, you sort of get a, you know, different viewpoint. Um, and sometimes you are almost forced into it. You know, oftentimes you see controllers you know, at a company for a year, year and a half, two years, and then, you know, leave, right? And end up, you know, the company's then in a pinch to, to find a new, you know, find a replacement. So fractional CFOs, you know, likely get a lot of work through, um, you know, just turnover, just, just natural progression yeah. of, a, of an accounting manager, a senior account controller leaving the business. Um, so, you know, I think it's always good to get a fresh set of eyes. And uh, you never know, some, you know, you, you've seen fractional CFOs go into a role really like it, really enjoy the, the company and, and stick around for, for longer than, you know, mm-hmm. expected and become a full-time employee. So I've um, mm-hmm. seen that plenty of times. Mm-hmm. So for for listeners who are, you know, um, working on the capital raise now or thinking about capital raise now, what do you think are the key pieces for the financial stack, for the capital raising financial stack? Yeah, so financial stack, you know, so from a from a from a software perspective, the financial stack, I would say, you know, you definitely want to have an accounting software, right, an ERP that can handle your level of activity. So if you're selling, you know, a high volume of transactions, low dollar value, um, you know, there's only so much you could do out of you know Excel spreadsheets. Um, so you want to have an ERP that can handle, you know the level of activity. So I kind of think of it, if you get to a $10 million in top line revenue, you know, um, high level of transactions, you probably need to upgrade your ERP to something that, you know, is a little more sophisticated. Um, inventory management, um, having a software in place to sort of manage the, um, you know, inventory management and forecasting, right, at a, at a SKU level, at a, at a level where you, um, you know, have, your founders asking questions, you know, are we going to run out of this, this product or, you know, do we need to procure more, um, you know, in real time, right? That data should be available in real time, theoretically, right? And, you know, you see smaller companies struggle with that and, um, you know, having key softwares in place is great, right? To support the financial stack. 
Um, and then, you know, you're probably working with credit card processors. You're working with, um, you know, different uh, different sort of ways to fulfill, you know, a sale. So shippers and, you know, so there's a lot of different sort of, this is spider web, right? So there's a lot of different elements, but, um, and there's softwares that sort of each component. So, um, you know, prioritizing that, right? What, what is most important? Getting a product to the customer. What software do I need to, you know, in my, in my you know, tech stack? What, what do I need to get that product to the end user? Um, you know, super important. And then how does it roll up into the financial statements? Um, having that ERP in place to, to, to manage that level of activity so you get real-time financial data and you're giving it to the right people, controller, CFO, how does that roll up to the founders and, and, and you know the and management? Um, so yeah, a lot of layers involved, but um, you know I think I think if you prioritize and you know start from the top, you, you know you'll you'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. What about cadence on financial reporting? When is when is it too late? When is it just in time? You know, from a monthly perspective, most most businesses are. You know, doing monthly financial reports, just checking in and trying to make decisions. Um, you need a dashboard. Um, when is when is what is an optimal time from the end of the month to to know your numbers? Yeah, I mean, I would say, well, you know, most of our clients are closing their books monthly within you know five to ten business days. Okay. You know, sometimes less, right? You know, if you're more sophisticated, you could close in two or three days, right? Hmm. Um, if it hinders your ability to make business decisions, to move operations and to sort of move the needle, if you're running into issues where, you know, inventory is, you know, a mess and you can't fulfill orders because you don't have the right data and you're not right, making the right decisions, that's when you know there's there's something, you know, there's a kink in, in, in the armor, right? And, and you have to dig into it, right? So, um, you know, it, monthly closes are important. Um, and then doing an annual, you know, from an inventory perspective, if you're doing, you know, if you're, you're maintaining inventory in a, in a warehouse that's owned and operated, or is it a third party, um, a 3PL, third party logistics provider, uh, doing a full inventory count annually. I think that's, that's important as well to make sure you're, um, you know, where inventory is to make sure nothing's damaged or, you know, you, you have a visibility into that. Um, so you can either do an annual physical or you could do cycle counts throughout the year um, so there's a you know the, the product getting to the end customer right knowing that where the uh, the issues lie and um, and then having that data available timely you know that you, you like you said monthly um, where it's not hindering operations I think is key mm -hmm. okay so on on a final note what what are your predictions and thoughts for for, for the rest of twenty twenty four? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know interest rates might um, might get cut by the Fed later this year. If they do, you know, potentially consumer spend you know increases. Um, but I don't I don't think it will necessarily be a high growth year. I think it's a, sort of a modest growth year for e coms. Um, e commerce is not going away by any means. Um, you know, there's there's physical big box stores that, you know, have a need to be uh, online, right? Be an online retailer. And then there's online retailers that primarily sell online that have never had a physical presence, but are now finding a need to have a physical presence, right? Now, now more people are out and consumers want to, you know, see and feel your product, depending on what the product is. So I think, I think you'll see maybe more, more businesses that are primarily online start to open up some retail locations or, you know, make sure you're in those big box stores, um, you know, through wholesale arrangements. Um, but, you know, I think from a growth perspective, you know, really depends on consumer spend and, and kind of where that goes. You know, anything can happen. As we've learned in the last few years, it, you know, there's, um, you, know, think, you know, things could happen that are outside of our control, right? But um, I would probably predict a modest growth year, um, you know, with, with higher growth potential moving into like 2025 and, and beyond that um but yeah i'm looking forward to, to seeing what what the future lies for us
yeah, we'll 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 we'll, we'll touch base again in twenty twenty five and and check on those predictions. Um, yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's been I I've certainly left this conversation smarter in 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 finance, particularly in relation to 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 capital raising. What investors want to see, what the landscape is, particularly at this point in time, and how um you know companies who are essentially re- who've raised to, to a more buoyant um you know capital markets you know in, pro- probably in 2025 as you said um it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you Lonnie for those who want to find out more about with them it's w i t h u m dot com are you active on any social media you know channels what, where where should we sort of follow um the conversation from here yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn, I think, is is probably the best. Um, I, I do some interviews too with some founders, so um, you know, always get to check out some content. And I think LinkedIn just feel free to reach out. And yeah, Kunle, you know, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. A pleasure, but, uh, a pleasure, a pleasure. And you do host events, right? Um, in with the yeah, Decom. we're so, we're uh, New York, New York based, um, but that's sort of the New York metro area. We're um, okay active in the market going to events or hosting events so i'm always looking to find you know new new partners and um um you know people that are interested in the space in the industry just to just to chat with so okay um yeah Good excited to, to hear any feedback we'll, we'll link to, to to all of the resources in, in the show notes lonnie it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the 2x e-commerce podcast thanks Colin. cheers